Welcome back, everyone. Let's take another look at one of Muhammad's battles. Here's the setting. Muhammad has killed or driven out all of Medina's troublesome Jews, and he's also conquered Mecca. Now, at this point, Muhammad's wars should be complete. I mean, after all, Muslim apologists assure us that it was the Jews, in part, who were causing Muhammad's trouble. And in the case of Muhammad's aggression against his own tribe, well, they had it coming. I mean, after all, they were mean to him, so he could rob and assault them in return. These people wronged us. We have the right to do this back to them. And so with this typical apologetic narrative in mind and Medina and Mecca firmly under Muhammad's control, we expect now for Muhammad's aggression to abate. After all, at the very least, Muhammad had repaid the vengeance of others in kind. More likely, however, Muhammad's punishment inflicted on his enemies far outweighed their crimes, and the Muslim sources seem disturbingly pleased to report the same. Further, if Muhammad's aggression persisted after these conquests, then Muslim apologists would be proven wrong, and that never happens, repeatedly, except in this case, where Muslim apologists are proven wrong, again. For the first time. You see, Muhammad continued to wage war against Arabs who had not, in fact, wronged him, such as the case with Muhammad's incursion against the Banu Jadima. As Professor Ibrahim notes in his recent book on Muhammad's military expeditions, the tradition describes the raid to Banu Jadima as a consequence of the conquest of Mecca, when Muhammad commanded his companions to attack those who were not following Islam. Now, while using force to spread Islam may sound familiar, it's just another apologetic narrative that gives a religious and therefore somewhat transcendent reason for Muhammad's violence. Remarkably, this motive for the raid against Banu Jadima is much less common than you would think, since the Muslim sources portray the majority of Muhammad's early battles as pursuing military, political, or economic objectives. Regardless, for this fight, Muhammad chose a much-adored figure in Islamic history, affectionately called the Sword of Allah. His real name was Khalid ibn Walid. This commander, Muhammad chose, took a course of action that is quite disturbing. When Khalid arrived at the location for his presumed religious proclamation, we are told he mistreated the Banu Jadima and killed some of them. Muslim narrators describe a reason for this mistreatment. Decades earlier, before the advent of Islam, men from Banu Jadima reportedly killed Khalid's paternal uncle. This is why, when Khalid arrived at Banu Jadima and they saw him, they were alarmed and took up their weapons. But he assured them, put down your weapons, for the people have become Muslims. He told them not to worry, as he had already converted to Islam. They reportedly affirmed, we are a Muslim community, we bless and trust Muhammad. We built the mosque and called a prayer in it. Still, one of the men of Banu Jadima did not trust Khalid. He could apparently predict his actions better than Muhammad, who was later a bit troubled by them. And he told his people, it is Khalid. By God, after you lay down your weapons, it will be nothing but leather manacles, and after leather manacles, it will be nothing but the smiting of necks. By God, I will never lay down my weapon. His people did not heed his advice and assured him, the people have become Muslims, nevertheless. Once Banu Jadima laid down their weapons because of what Khalid had said, he ordered that their hands should be tied behind their backs. Then he put them to the sword, killing some of them. As you can see, this account creates a number of problems. First, Muhammad was apparently unaware of Khalid's brutality, of which there's more to come, believe me. However, However, he was made aware of it later, and Muhammad still continued to use him in future battles. Additionally, Khalid's grudge against these people for his uncle's death was known, among others at least. Muhammad apparently didn't know, and he made a poor and tragic choice. Second, why did Muhammad send Khalid in the first place since the Banu Jadim had already accepted Islam? Muhammad sent Khalid and his army, Muslims, who ended up killing other Muslims. Ibrahim comments, for these reasons, the logic goes, a tweak in the literary portrayal of Khalid seemed necessary. Muslim narrators, as we have often encountered in Arabic traditions, tweak narratives by creating opposing memories. This is one reason why competing reports justify Khalid's behavior and offer reasons for his killing of fellow Muslims. And what were these reasons created by Muslim historiographers? I'm glad you asked. First, to paraphrase, someone else made me do it. This is a true classic. It's one of my favorites, but it hasn't worked since the first grade. Second, he was doing what Muhammad told him to do because of their resistance to Islam. This is the same as the first reason. It just substitutes a different name for who gave the command, and it adds a little Islam-style religiosity to it. No points for originality here. Third, Khalid wasn't absolutely sure that the people had converted to Islam, so he killed him just to be safe. I'm sure we've all done something similar a time or two, right? For Muhammad's part, Muslim historians made sure their narratives absolved Muhammad of any guilt for Khalid's controversial actions, while they also glorified the sword of Allah. 
Ibrahim's book describes how he was eventually exalted to the status of miracle worker. Apparently, being a great warrior was enough for Muslim historians to salivate over his pool of memories. So that's the Muslim equivalent of a happy ending, I guess, except for what happens next. You see, a few years later, we run into Khalid again. This time, similar to our first story, we find Muslims killing Muslims, sort of, in what's known as the apostasy wars. It seems that Muslims after Muhammad's death started leaving Islam faster than they are now. In this account, we are introduced to more of Khalid's talents, cutting off heads, copulating, and cooking. Ibrahim comments, during the so-called apostasy wars, Khalid humiliated a fellow Muslim named Malik because he figured he was an apostate, killed him, and then fornicated with his wife. Then he adds in a footnote that Muslim narrators describe a horrific scene. Khalid required that Malik's head be cooked in a pot from which Khalid ate as he intended to scare the apostates in Arabia with this act. On the same day, Khalid took Malik's wife, Layla bint al-Manhal, and fornicated with her. Now, if there's anyone who really needs to weigh in on this, it's the scholars over at Islam QA. They give us their own opinions. They also cite other expert Muslim scholars to give us a really fully formed Islamic perspective on these sorts of issues. I'll put this link in the description box for you where you can see how it would have been immoral for Khalid to do what he did, except that Malik supposedly committed an act of apostasy, which invalidated his marriage and left his wife to the Quran's rules for female prisoners, which permits Muslim men to have intercourse with them. Another scholar makes clear that Khalid took her as a prisoner and there is no waiting period, meaning before intercourse, for prisoners. And some resist the clear attestation in Muslim sources that the sword of Allah did this with a former wife on the very night he killed the woman's husband. But even if he did, it can still be explained satisfactorily. Those of you who know the Hadith know that Muslims basically have to approve of Khalid quickly pouncing on the dead man's wife. In exegeting verses from the Quran that allow men to have sex with slave girls, Muslim narrators tell of a situation where Muhammad's soldiers were reluctant to have intercourse with female prisoners because of their husbands, who would have either been recently deceased or taken prisoner. So Allah sent down the verse and Muhammad recited it. Condemn Khalid's actions with Malik and his wife, barbaric as they were, and you condemn Allah and Muhammad. So many medieval Muslim historiographers worked to absolve Muhammad of Khalid's controversial actions, and not content with that, many eventually absolved Khalid himself. Further, I said that Muslim historiographers exalted him to miracle worker status. Well, his exaltation continues in various forms. You can search his name in YouTube or other social media and find video after video praising him. So feel free to go watch those if you want. But I have a suspicion that you've already seen enough of the sword of Allah. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.